So give us a historical context of global emergencies and what happens once they're done and why this time could be different. Yeah, so we've done um, a lot of historical analysis on global health emergencies. And as you mentioned at the beginning, um, usually you tend to see um, a down leg going into the World Health Organization announcement, which actually happened quite some time ago. Um, and then markets as well as the economy soon recover. Um, in other words, it's a pretty short lived impact. Um, but as you mentioned, and as we've written in our research, um, we think this time is quite different, um, essentially for two main reasons. Um, the one being one of the more obvious ones is that, you know, pretty much the world's second largest economy, um, China, largest contributor to global growth, um, making up about 17 percent of global GDP, essentially came to a standstill for roughly a month and a half. Um, that clearly has an impact on the global growth number, um, as well as uh, ultimately the supply chains. Uh, the other reason we think this time is different is because the coronavirus was perhaps, or at least the market reaction to it, was perhaps an excuse for maybe some bigger concerns. When we were visiting clients at the end of last year, early this year, before the virus actually hit, um, people were wondering, you know, what's the source of upside for markets? Um, you know, we're in a really long economic expansion in the United States. Uh, valuations are stretched. Uh, so at least at the time, it wasn't expected that the world's central banks would engage in a whole lot more easing. So add in this unexpected risk of coronavirus, it was almost an excuse for um, markets to essentially de-risk. We are continuing to see oil under pressure at the moment. This, of course, after a rebound, after they collapsed on Monday. I do wonder, though, if we're looking at the economic impact of all of this, will cheaper oil help in providing some sort of monetary cushion, if you will? Well, you know, in the past, um, specifically looking at the U.S. economy, because that's one economy we're focusing on for whether this global downturn ends up being significantly worse, um, in the past, lower oil prices would have been a boon for the U.S. economy. Um, lower prices would increase purchasing powers of consumers. Um, consumers make up a big chunk of U.S. economic growth. Um, but what we saw within um, this past global slowdown and when oil prices crashed in 2015, 2016, um, we saw a different reaction to the U.S. economy. We're now one of the largest producers of oil, and we could potentially see some downside in capital expenditures and employment in the energy industry. So it's not really the boom that it used to be. Alejandra, you know, we're looking at market pricing in terms of expectations of a U.S. recession over the next 12 months, and it's pretty much over 50 percent right now. I'd like to kind of get your views on the policy response, because this chart that I want to bring up on the Bloomberg showing that markets are also pricing in 75 basis point more to be cut at the March 18th meeting for the Fed. So there's lots of criticism that monetary policy, conventional or unconventional is a pretty blunt tool when it comes to addressing a slowdown that's going to be caused by a global, potentially a pandemic. Yeah, so um, you're right. In terms of monetary policy, um, it can happen very quickly, um, but monetary policy can not end the coronavirus, clearly. Um, there needs to be some sort of fiscal support. Um, so, you know, essentially looking at, at, at two things. Um, first, how quickly does the virus spread? Is there going to be fiscal support um, in terms of adding more testing kits, um, giving uh, free sick leave to people um, who you know, if they take time off because they have a few symptoms, um, that's one of the things that was ultimately being proposed. Um, how does it affect sentiment? And to me, this is ultimately going to be the biggest driver of where we actually get U.S. recession. Um, assume it, we're not, uh, let, let me put in that we don't think, um, we're, we're not ready to say that the U.S. will fall into recession, but what's been holding it up has been the consumer, low unemployment, um, strong housing, and if the consumer stops spending, um, then services, which is a big chunk of the economy, could potentially deteriorate. And this could have a feedback loop. Um, if we look at the amount of people that are employed within leisure and hospitality, as well as brick and mortar retail, this is about 25 percent of the private workforce. Um, if people stop spending, those people lose jobs, you ultimately get a feedback loop and it could be pretty negative. Um, so any sort of fiscal support that would um, support those individuals who um, don't have uh, paid sick leave, um, increased testing, um, support for small and medium sized enterprises that are maybe having trouble getting access to, um, uh, to funding on a monthly to month basis. Um, and then there's obviously been proposals of um, reducing the payroll tax or the social security tax to zero percent. 
Um, it's a fairly regressive tax, so reducing it would um, probably help the middle class and lower rungs of the income ladder. Very quickly, Alejandro, what are the implications for global trade and in particular the phase one trade deal? Well, I, I, I don't think uh, the, the, the particular goals that were signed by China will be met this year. Um, I, there actually is a clause in the agreement um, that pretty much implies that if something catastrophic happens, then they won't have to meet the goals this year. Um, longer term, there could be implications on global um, just overall supply chains. Um, the coronavirus not being the main cause. I mean, obviously, I think it started with uh, the trade war that we've had over the couple of years, sort of people starting to rethink um, these broad global supply chains. And I think the coronavirus further emphasizes that.